Hi, welcome to another Avenue X video. And as you can see, this is a special video. I'm not using my usual opening lines and stuff for this video because it's not talking about any specific drama, but it's talking about something that I've mentioned on Facebook and also on my community post on YouTube and a motorcycle about the policy that may very soon come out in China that will restrict Chinese drama to 40 episodes. At this stage, this is still a draft which comes from the uh, state agency of broadcasting film television. I can never remember its name, but basically the institute in China that basically controls our cultural stuff and films and televisions. It's called draft and it's called suggestions. This is how it works in China. It's usually, it comes out as policies, regulations, suggestions. That's not necessarily law, but when it comes out, you'd better obey it. This one is not out yet. So it's finalized form in terms of exactly how that works. What does it apply to? Does it apply to say all TV uh, series or does it only apply to say the ones go on satellite TV? Uh, how does that affect web dramas? Is there uh, exceptions? All that details are not yet out there. But the highly likelihood of some form of constricting the length of dramas a policy will come out at least from what i've heard <laughs> information that i got gathered from people who work in the industry in companies uh, when this draft kind of came out to them a lot of companies pulled all nighters emergency meetings because some of them have dramas on hand that's not aired yet and that may not fit into the policy some of them are in the planning stage of making new stuff that need to be changed now if this is going to affect anytime soon. It definitely is not a groundless rumor. Probably is going to happen. Uh, exactly in what form, not known yet. And I feel um, it's necessary to talk about the Chinese dramas, current situations. If you're not aware of it, um, if you find it interesting, if you've been watching Chinese dramas and you wonder about things, you know, how it all works. I am by no means an expert. I used to work in the industry. I haven't for a long time. I still have friends in there, but you know, it's, it's a circle that's like not that uh, close to me anymore. So my information is not 100% up to date and definitely not 100% correct. To talk about this possible, probable policy, we need to first actually understand how Chinese drama work. If you have a project that you want to make, your production company or multiple production companies join together, you need to submit a proposal to the organization that I just can't remember the name of, Guodian, okay? And then basically that is putting it on record or in file and you'll get a permit number. And in this proposal, you would have to tell who is the company that's responsible for producing this, what kind of drama it is, for example, contemporary period or sort of in between. So like say last century uh, focused story, uh, the episode account the synopsis, right? You have to provide these information to them. And so basically you have Bei An and you have this permit number. Once you finish production, you have to submit it for censorship. So there's two, um, two steps. And in China, dramas are not made like most dramas made in the US, which is seasonal, which is you film a couple of episodes, you write a couple of episodes, you air it and you change stuff as you go along throughout the year. In China, everything is 99% made in one go. So it's bulk produced. If we have a 40 episode, 50 episode drama, we film it all together and then we go into post-production and then we throw them out all together. Two episodes per day, if it's on satellite TV, if it's on web, these days often six to eight episodes per week. So it runs about a month or so and then it's gone, it's done. Because of this, in China, dramas are purchased per episode uh, for the money of it. For example, your production company, you made a drama and now you're gonna go and sell it to satellite TV stations or web streaming platforms and you price it per episode. It's been done like this for a long time and it's just the way it is, you know, like nobody really are doing it in another way. And so that is the general process of getting something made and sold in China in a drama land. Understanding this is very important uh, to what I need to talk about now, which is what has been happening within the industry for the past four years or so. So starting from 2015 and probably between 15 and 17, Chinese drama land had a huge shift. First is how web drama becomes more and more prominent and satellite TV start to lose its hold, I guess, or at least the presence. Also, a lot of capital rushed in money from everywhere, from, from investors who have nothing to do <laughs> 
and who know nothing about this industry at all. You see the huge rise of IP, and you see a insanely expensive copyright sold of a drama. You see the bloating of the length of dramas. You also see just skyrocketing lead actor actresses pay. All this happened mostly because capital came in and wants to play it pretty much like what it wants to do with other things like derivatives. You know, it, it's not that different as buying and selling soybeans or tulips. The situation very quickly got extremely crazy and out of control. To give you an idea, at the peak of the copyright selling and of dramas, certain dramas can reach close to 15 million RMB per episode when you sell it to the TV stations and streaming platforms. 15 million RMB is about a little bit more than 2 million USD, but that's per episode. If you have a drama that's like 60, 70, 80 episodes long, like a lot of period dramas are, you easily go over 1 billion RMB. I think the highest record was held by Empress in Palace 2. I don't have like solid proof, but I think it's very well known within the industry. It's one of those most expensive dramas ever sold. I think that one hit went over the 1 billion mark. And many other dramas closely hit the mark of over a 10 million RMB per episode. Easily over say 500 million RMB, probably between 500 million and a billion RMB for those dramas, those long form dramas to be sold. Because dramas are sold per episode, very easily you can see the incentive of making dramas unnecessarily long and bloated because one more episode is an extra 15, 10 million RMB. You know, that's like more money than most of the mid-class working people could possibly earn in their lifetime. The injection of suddenly an influx of capital into this, this uh, industry caused many ripple effects and problems. Here are a couple. The first obviously is, is the content quality drop because you have to blow the lens, the things become unnecessarily draggy from a viewer's standpoint. If you don't know, 10 Miles of Peach Blossoms was initially a 40 episode drama script because the script got leaked and I read everything. <laughs> all of its script and it's pretty clear that the original script is very closely followed but the editing changed its its pacing and its length and it eventually got edited into a 58 episode <laughs> drama so it bloated close to half of, of its original content right almost like 50 percent Nivarning fire i think originally it's also a 40 episode script and eventually it ended up being 54 so it kind of became a common practice. So you can just get money in editing room, in post-production, without actually having to invest longer <laughs> title song, longer ending song, and then, and then, you know, 45 minutes, actually only 30 or so minutes content is there, that type of thing. So this is a very common practice. The first bad thing that happens is you see this, this <sighs> Secondly, you are an investment. I want the money back. What I would do is I will find the best way to get my money back traffic actors become extremely hot and popular. The fact is only that many people are that popular and having that big a following, having those fan base who would go in and spend money and watch their drama, doesn't matter how crappy it is, we're just doing it for our idol, right? Because of that, only a very small number of actors are considered for lead roles of big productions because they have the ability to draw money in. The other, other ones who don't happen to have that big a fan following, who might be a better actress or actor for a particular role, who might be a better actor or actress, period, do not have the opportunity to have those roles because they simply don't draw money in. So you keep seeing the same face, that couple of faces, male or female, in every drama you can possibly see. So that's one big problem. The third problem that it creates is you have this huge increase of those very worthwhile, expensive traffic actors wage or their, their, their payment, right? And the money that they earn from making the dramas. It tips the reasonable proportion of the budget because usually, right? 30%, maybe less than 40% of money goes into the pay, the, the money that you pay for every actor added together. And then you need another 30, 40, sometimes even 50% for the actual production, you know, making the costumes, making the sets, hiring, hiring everything, paying for the crew and stuff. And then you leave 20, 30% for promotion. Really? That was like the reasonable way of doing it. But then because of the huge increase of the value of those actors, they get paid with ridiculous amount of money, which results in 
everything else getting crushed. Your production quality goes down, the money that goes into the production goes down, the salaries for every other people who work on the crew, from the cinematographer to continuity to everybody, gets compressed. Resulting in a lot of people who work in an industry who don't work in front of the camera, just can't continue working in the industry. If you've seen the interview that I've done with a director last year, early last year, he's got friends who's been in the industry since the 90s, who's been there for decades. For the recent at least five to even 10 years, they don't see any increase in their pay because all the money goes to the lead actors to the point where they just can't continue working in the industry anymore. They have their mortgage, they have their children to take care of. So they quit, they have to quit and then go find other things to do. But that results in a huge loss of the talents. The people who actually were well-trained, who have worked for years, who have the experiences. Now that would impact obviously the quality of productions. I mean, frankly speaking, if you look at like Xu Ni Fu Shen Ruomong, right? I can think of even Chen Qingling. I don't want to be mean, but cinematography and lighting in those dramas are just like, if it's student work, if I did it in film school, my teacher would have smacked me in front of the entire class. I'm just saying, people who are actually good at doing this job can't continue doing it. They leave and you see a drop of quality and you can't help that. On a big scale, it is happening. Another thing, I can't remember this, the fourth or fifth thing is <laughs> IP becomes the most popular way of investing money, picking scripts and then making it into drama. It already has a fan base, you know, people are gonna go into it to watch either for the actor or for the original no, web novel mostly. So original scripts don't have any breathing rooms. It becomes the thing that nobody wants to touch. Even if you have something that's brilliantly written, it's very difficult to get it made. And the good script writers just don't write anymore because there's nobody asking them to write it. That is also not good for the industry. And also dramas become increasingly lead actor centered. Chinese drama tend to be director centered instead of say script writer centered as you see in South Korea. But now lead actor also have a lot of say. Some very ridiculous situations such as like the lead actor comes into the, 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 the production, bringing in her or his own script writers. Okay, plural. Changing the script on, on spot. And they have that much power because they really are the people who would make this drama sell or the investment company, right? Just 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 like airdrop people into the into the production and change the script. Because they have money, they can they can do that. It just sounds absolutely ridiculous, but it happens. How funny is that? So these are a couple of the bad effects of the capitals rushing in. Obviously, it has other good things such as suddenly the whole industry goes pretty crazy, right? So many stuff gets produced. Obviously, when you have more stuff produced, there's a higher possibility of a few of them being really good. But in general, it really does impact this industry in ways that are not healthy and not good. More on that side instead of the positive side. So what happened was since last year, the state start to to interfere. First, it had this xian gu ling, which is a restriction on period dramas because period dramas are just like too many of them and too long. So every drama is like 70, 80, 90 episodes. So they start to put a cap on that. That greatly affected actually the industry. Also, capital's money started to pull out since last year. What happened was the number of productions that are in production, for example, right now in China, compared to last year this time, or even like earlier on, probably early last year or even 2017, has greatly decreased. So these days, if you're a good actor, even you're a famous, well-known good actor, if you actually get an offer to, to be in a drama, be grateful because so many people are actually literally sitting there and not doing any job because there's just no drama. Like the number has dwindled so much because of the policy in place and you know, like investors leaving, leaving this industry. They've, they've had their share. They've moved on. The money has moved on, leaving the decimated uh, industry in its very sad and crippled stage. Now, if this 40 episode thing, right, becomes a real thing, what it would do is first, since last year, most dramas started to lower its sort of copyright selling per episode. It used to be able to hit 15 million, but now it's all well under, I think, 10 million and probably around somewhere between a couple of million to, to 8 million streaming platforms have come out and said in public that we're gonna cap our purchase price for 
dramas per episode. And if now you put in the 40 episode thing, so that will completely restrict what a drama can sell for. What that could do, obviously, is now dramas need to have a different way of, of selling it. We give up the per episode thing and probably looking at it as a whole. How that would work in the future uh, is not clear yet. But this type of restraint is clearly aimed at the problems that the previous bloated prices and length of dramas have caused for this industry, hoping that it could turn things around a bit. When you do not have that crazy market, you have to look at quality first. When you don't rely on traffic actors to bring in money, you start to give more opportunities to actors and actresses who might actually be more talented and more diverse, right? You have different types of stories coming out instead of all just IP or just Da Nunju or just Mary Sue. And obviously reducing the lead actors pay so that everybody can get more money into this industry. People need to be able to earn a decent living doing this job to continue doing this job. So this type of policy is not a whim. It's not somebody thought about it and just decided to do it. It actually has a lot of thought that happened behind the scenes for, for the policymakers to decide to, to go for it. It totally is not about this is a totalitarian society and you know the government can do whatever it wants. It's so much more complicated than that. On one hand, I often also joke about Guangdian and, and those organizations, institutions, what they do. On the other hand, there's actually a lot of ongoing rumors about them that are actually not true at all. Most of the problems in China are very complex because it is China. It is in a country that has that big a population, a lot of complex issues in, in the play. It is never easy for any policymakers to, to even just decide to do one thing because the ripple effects can be huge and it cannot always be predicted. So they don't have an easy life either. Something needs to be done. If nobody actually go and do anything and just let the market take over, right? Eventually it's gonna impact the industry itself. It's gonna create some form of self-destruction and that's not gonna fare well for anyone who is doing it. Whether the actors, directors, everybody who works at technical jobs or the stars, you know, like if you wanna see them existing on screen for a long time to come, if you want them to have a fruitful and longevity career, you know, the only thing that can allow that to happen is have a very healthy industry so that this can continue. If the industry dies, they disappear from your screen. You are not gonna see your favorite actors, actresses, stars anymore. I think if this actually happens, there will be exceptions. There will be ways that you can get longer dramas out. But I think all in all, I'm more for it than against it because of the problems that are ongoing and what this one is trying to do is trying to make the situation move towards a better direction. 2019 is the year that you still see a, some of the dramas from previous period that were made and then finally got aired. So you still see some of the works that's made within the craze period. But after this year, probably a bit of next year, most of those stocked up stuff will have already come out. If they haven't, they probably will never come out anymore. And then you're gonna see the stuff that's been made after the policy shift. And it will be very interesting to see if the quality improves, if things become better. I can almost tell like in 2019 summer, all the dramas that came out, there's a general increase of quality already. Now, arguably, because so many dramas came out because of 70th anniversary, they have to come out. You do see a little bit sort of more emphasis on the quality of the production itself instead of saying we have this, this actor or this actress leading a big IP. Big IP is dying. Mary Sue's story is dying. And I think reasonable intelligent people who work in the industry already realized that things are changing and they better adapt to it. Uh, one final news about um, the Bei An, the put things in file and on record thing is in August, uh, Guangdian just announced uh, a, a number of dramas that have been uh, given permit to film. So they are not past censorship yet. They're at the stage of pre-production and now we allow you to make it. And you see the huge change. Over 75% of those dramas are contemporary dramas. The period and modern drama, so modern would be like last century focused, such as Mingguo, such as, you know, around the middle of the century stuff, plus P 
period drama. Only make up about twenty five percent of all the dramas that's been given permit, and the particular ancient setting period dramas, I think, is around only ten percent. That shows you what the policy is directing, or all the the companies that are making dramas now realize what they need to do. So we will see a huge decrease of period dramas, obviously, because most period dramas are IP and IP. You know, like. We did have too many really bad period dramas for the past few years, so I understand this this shift in trying to move things to the other side, and then to to look at more diverse stories because contemporary life it has more more possibilities. You know, you have you have more angles, you have different professions, different types of stories,、um, like crime type of、uh, scripts have a huge increase. Uh, since last year, many because the policy has opened that door a bit for this genre. So you see more coming in. Not that I have a problem with period dramas. I really like period dramas. But you need to write good period dramas, and it cannot always be harem fight and gods and wuxia and fantasies. It's really hard to be innovative <laughs> with period dramas, and because the the lump sum of period dramas have had so many problems. That has to do with bloating of the episodes, a crazy price, a crazy price for actors and actresses, tax evasion. If you don't know about those, oh, those are huge things right now.、Uh, oh, I forgot to mention since last year, right? The the film and television industry in China just got so tax centered because of a couple of things that happened. So many famous people in the industry and also companies got like into. With the government, in terms of tax, all in all, in consideration, I think this is a reasonable and understandable policy shift, and you see, see the market sh- changing. And I think it wouldn't take that long for w- us to see if actually this is doing a good thing, a good service to to the health of the entire industry. If we see better stuff coming out next year, then we can tell, you know, it actually is a reasonable strategy to do such a thing. So this is my rant. And sort of my information that I would like to share with whoever is interested in Chinese drama land about the current situation, what is going on, why it is happening, what it's trying to do. I do hope it's all for the for the better and for the good. I still actually really miss the nineties old days when dramas are short but just really well made and condensed. There was a time when eight episodes was the cap for Chinese dramas, and then twenty something, twenty twenty four. There was a time when anything that hits forty would actually have have the title written underneath that says "champion dian shi lian shi ju," which means long form TV serialized drama. Yeah, that was a tradition, and somehow now it becomes forty is the minimum accepted number. Any drama can easily go over fifty, sixty, seventy. As a drama reviewer,、uh, secretly,、um, I, I actually really want dramas to be shorter because. Watching sixty episodes drama and three at a time is not humanly、um, reasonable, possible. It's pretty much a form of torture. <laughs> I do want to see better work, but spending less of my energy and time wasting it on unnecessary stuff. So thank you for watching Up New X. Thank you, thank you for sticking through this video. I'll see you in my next video. Meanwhile, live long and happy drama watching.